All right. This morning, all you very lucky people got up extra early to come here <laughs> to be treated to philosophy. <laughs> early in the morning, what could go wrong there? Uh, so I, I admire your, your hardiness. Uh, no, I didn't say foolhardy. Somewhere. Hardiness. <laughs> and uh, we'll try to, <laughs> try to ease the pain. Uh, the, the first thing we have to do, let me say something about uh, some remarks that Paul was making there uh, about applying God's word to, to the God's world. And, and the, I think the average Christian of whatever denominational stripe thinks of the gospel as applied to him or herself. This is how I please God or walk with God. This is how I go to heaven and I go to be with God when I die. But uh, it can be a very narrow vision with, with horse blinders on. Uh, so this is what it concerns, and the rest of the world just seems to get worse and worse, and it's going to hell in a handbasket, and we really don't have any solutions for all of that. We just keep our eyes on, on pleasing God. But part of pleasing God is, is that calling to apply uh, His Word as widely as we can. And this is one of the things that I think is the, the real genius of the Calvinist tradition. There are ways I don't agree with Calvin, but one way that I do is that the, the gospel isn't just a, a, a means of salvation. It's a means of seeing the transformation of the entire creation. So the, the Calvinist tradition has always been concerned with uh, how does belief in God affect our view of blank, and then you fill the blank in with law, culture, art, philosophy, science, and so on. So all of those questions about the relationship of, it's usually phrased today in the media, religion and something else, it's, for us, it's, since we know God, what view should we take of science and all the rest of it? Um, and those are what are going to be addressed in this. Those can only be addressed through philosophy. Now, that may be a jarring claim and one that's not welcome. Because, you see, the average Christian, again, wants to think that if he or she just sits down in the pew with his Bible and reads it and prays, that he'll see what view a Christian should take of physics. Or tell us exactly what laws to have. Or what view should we take of what the state should and shouldn't do. Or what view should we have of art. And then, what the people who insist on that are crashingly disappointed when either they come up with nothing or they come up with all different opposing points of view. Now that is because they haven't first worked out, and this is really difficult, I'm sorry to have to tell you this, I'm the bearer of the bad news, it's because they haven't worked out a Christian philosophy. And it's only in the light of that that they're going to be able to see how being a Christian should affect science, law, art, pop culture, and so on and on and on the rest. Why? Well, that's because of the very nature of philosophy and what it is. That's where we start this morning. What is it? What do philosophers make theories about? Look, we've got a bunch of sciences. This is the way I usually start with my introductory class. We have all these sciences. We have math, physics, biology, psychology, mm -hmm. logic, linguistics, sociology. We have, and th this isn't a complete list. There are more sciences than this. <laughs> so what's left for philosophy? What is it that none of these address or try to answer? What's left for philosophy? And if the answer is nothing, maybe philosophy is a ruse. <laughs> <laughs> Keep people out of the unemployment office. <laughs> but what would be left for the study? A worldview. Well, what would that be? What, why is that anything different from it, all of these? It, it's not holistic, it encompasses. Well, you're on the right track. I'm just thinking of the Dewey Decimal System where the, the first uh, 100 numbers are for general works, yeah. like encyclopedias and dictionaries, okay. and then the hundreds is the philosophy. Okay. Which, uh, why is that? Which I think underscores your point. Yeah. Well, what is philosophy? What, what are its theories going to be about? Relationships. See, that's usually somebody says, 
well, is it about how all of those relate? And that's what you were getting. It's more general. It's about the relation. It's about how all of those hang together. It's an overview of them all. What are the relationships? <coughs> so sometimes this excites people, undergraduates. Who, yeah, I like that. And others have exactly the opposite. Oh, my God. I have enough trouble doing each one of these. And you want to worry about theories about how they all hang together? But that's what it's about. One famous American philosopher put it this way. Philosophy is about how all things, in the widest sense of things, hang together in the widest sense of hang together. <laughs> and I like that. That's, it's very accurate. So you understand what I'm saying here is the uh, arguments about the relationships of, say, biology and physics are not biological questions or physical questions. They're philosophical questions. Arguments over the relationship between <coughs> mathematics and physics are not mathematical questions or physics questions. They're philosophical questions. And insofar as the scientists who work in those areas engage in those questions, they have stepped out of their own field proper and are doing philosophy. Um, the major ones all recognize that. Einstein said whenever he tried to reflect on his theories in physics, it took him immediately into philosophy, into the theory of knowledge, and so on. And he knew it. Heisenberg said the same thing. The relationship between them all. What's a theory of that going to look like? And the answer is one of two things. General theory of reality. This is not plugging. There's three underneath that plugin. Okay. A general theory of reality. Now, here's one way to think of it. This is the way the people who cooked up philosophy about about 650 BC. This is the way they, they thought of it. All of these different are different sides to reality. These all study reality. But if these are like the beads on a necklace, what is the string that links them together? That's the way they put it. They put it that way because they were pagans. I'm going to argue later that's not the right way to ask the question. But they, that's the way they put it. If these are the beads, what is the string? And the, the theory, the, this is general theory of reality because these are specific ones. These are each specific sides to reality that each discipline abstracts and studies. So we can look at reality from its side of its physical properties and laws, its biology, biological properties and laws, its psychological properties and laws, its social, its economic, and so on. And those are all studying reality. But the general theory is going to cover everything. What is the most basic nature of reality? What's the string that links them all together? What are they all sides of? Now, there's a proper name for this study and a nickname. The proper name for this is ontology, not a word you see every day. And the nickname for this is metaphysics. Metaphysics is a strange word, and I can easily demystify it for you. After Aristotle died, his two nephews decided to edit his class lectures <coughs> and publish them. So they edited all his lectures on physics, and they published them. And then they found his lectures on theory of reality. And they didn't know what to call it. So they called it Metaphysics, the book that comes after the physics. <laughs> that's, that's all it meant, the book after the physics. And that became a nickname for the content of the book. You know, That sometimes happens, that the name of a container becomes the name of the contents. In South Jersey, uh, in the 19th century, there was a guy uh, who made bottles for whiskey. And his name was Booze, and so he made he made and they were the booze bottles 
were the ones that they put the whiskey in that became the name of the content instead of the name of the container. Okay, this is the same thing. Now, there's another kind of theory, general theory of knowledge. And it has a proper name too. And the proper name for this is epistemology. So there are two ways that we get general theories about how everything hangs together. One is a general theory of reality. What's the nature of reality itself of which all these are sides? The other is these are also all also branches of knowledge. There's mathematical knowledge and artistic knowledge. There's sociological, linguistic, and biological and logical. All different kinds of knowledge. But what is knowledge itself of which these are all sides? What's the real nature of that knowledge? Okay? So, now, if that's not daunting enough, uh, then we, we'll try to find something more daunting. But this is, this is a pretty uh, uh, tall order. Now, oh, and I meant to say, uh, please, I will have a time for question and answers at the end, but please don't hold your questions. Don't let anything go by that's not cleared or needs clarity or you want to object to or say, no, that just sounds wrong, or would this be an example of it? Uh, interrupt constantly because otherwise I'll never be sure that it's been getting being clear to you. I was simply going to ask in those two ways of uh, two general theories. Is there not a sequence that before one can have a general theory of reality, one has to have some sense of how one can know anything, including reality? So sequentially, at least, I would think that the general theory of knowledge, one has to have some view of that issue before one can have any confidence in a view of the general theory of reality. All right, now this, you all understand this is a question about the, nature, the relationship between these two general theories. Wouldn't you have to have an epistemology to have an ontology? And the answer is that you can argue it the other way as well. If you didn't know what reality was, you couldn't very well get a theory of knowledge. And, and I think that, it, that in fact what I'm going to argue is that the view that both of these are controlled by whatever someone thinks is divine. So that it, it, each of these, it, neither of these is basic uh, to the other in the sense that you can do one without the other. You can't do one first without getting your feet in the other one. So as soon as you try to give an account of a theory of knowledge, you start assuming reality is like this. As soon as you start to, to propose reality is like this, you're assuming certain things about how we can know and what we can know. So they are inextricably tied together. So asking which one of these comes first is basic. The other is like asking which leg is more important when you climb a mountain, the right <laughs> leg or your left. It, no, sorry, you, you can't get away from both. They're linked together. But I would argue, and this would go back to the lectures I gave here last year on the two ideas of the nature of God, that uh, if you have the proper idea of the nature of, of God, if you have the right divinity, then you're going to have the right view of these. And if you have a wrong divinity, you're going to have a wrong view of these. And here again is something uh, that's very much in line with the Calvinist tradition. You have to have the right God, or you don't get creation straight. Now, now there, I have to tell you, 99.9% .9 of all Christian thinkers have not held that to be true. What they, have all, what they all do is say, there's the book of God in scripture, and there's the book of God in nature, and it's up to us to interpret them and put them together and harmonize them, mm -hmm. as though they're independent. And Calvin sees it differently. For Calvin, scripture supplies the spectacles through which the book of nature must be read. So it's not the same that it's not that everybody confronts nature and gets all the same conclusions there, and then we have different conclusions about uh, how the true God and how to please God, and now we we piece these together. That's not it. And I'm, I'm, I'll give you before we leave this morning some excellent reasons to think that that's true. That Calvin was right about that. Paul Darius.
Paul makes the same. No, okay. Basically, it's not. Yeah. It doesn't don't count. It's not right. Paul. But here's what we're up to. Up, up. Here's what we're about. Unless you've got a Christian perspective on how to hang all those together, you're not going to get the answer to, since we know God, what should we think about physics, biology, chemistry, logic, sociology, economics. You're not going to get any answers to those questions. You can't sit and read them out of the Bible. Now, that's the fundamentalist program. I'm sorry to drop the F word on you. <laughs> <laughs> the fundamentalist program is that the Bible is an encyclopedia. And whatever you need to know, you go look it up. So whatever you're dealing with, you first see what Scripture has to say on the subject. That assumes, of course, that it's going to have something to say. So if you're dealing with metal stress or heat transfer, we go to Scripture to see what it has to say. I hope it's obvious the answer is zero. It doesn't say anything about that because the Bible is a collection of the covenants God has made through history with people he wants to redeem. And that's what it's about. It's about the contents of the covenant. It's, Galileo had it much closer to being right when he said, the Bible doesn't tell us how the heavens go, it tells us how to go to heaven. <laughs> because people were telling him, Bellinarm, for example, Cardinal Bellinarm, that the scripture says that the sun goes around the earth. So you can't say, no, the earth goes around the sun. He was saying, Scripture doesn't teach anything about that. It's just reporting what we see when we look in the sky, and it's not making any pronouncements about uh, astronomy. We get astronomy knowledge by doing astronomy, not by looking up in the Bible what taking it to be an encyclopedia. So that's why a Christian philosophy is a necessary thing. Now notice something else Christian philosophy is not. Christian philosophy would not be a way of presenting the gospel to the non-Christian. Clear? This is a way of telling Christians how to do philosophy and therefore what perspective they should take on the sciences. It, it's how Christians should deal with theories. <coughs> but one of the big objections to Dewey Root's philosophy came from Professor Van Til in Philadelphia who kept saying about it, but this is no way to present the gospel to the non-Christian. That's not what he's doing. And uh, one day I had lunch with Van Til and explained that. I said, he's trying to show Christians how to do theories, not presenting the gospel to the non-Christian. And he said, well, then I like it less. That's what he should be doing. <laughs> but that just says he can't have his own calling. He has to do what I'm doing. I'm sorry, but that, that's just not right. So do you understand that this is not a defense of the Christian religion? It's not proving God exists. It's saying we already know God, so we already know that's true. Now what should philosophy be like? All right, if this much is at least clear, then let me add one or two more remarks, and then we'll go to how people always did tried to get a theory of reality, because that's the one we're going to, we're going to uh, concentrate on. Next week we'll talk about Dewey Rude's ontology, his theory of reality. Dewey Rude did not work out an epistemology, but the ontology, insofar as it goes and insofar as we can see that it looks really good and promising, has a lot to say about how an epistemology would go. And, and that's what I'll be talking to the ASA about after this session next week, after the service, church service next week, um, what an epistemology would look like and how does belief in God fit into that? How do we know that? I'm going to argue that belief in God is not blind faith in certainty. Yes? Uh, I just wondered, would you be able to enlighten us about the philosopher Wittgenstein would feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> I, I once read that he um, well, he's a complicated character, and um, in order to understand a good bit of what he did, um, you would have to have a, a pretty good working knowledge of modern symbolic logic. But I can give you a thumbnail sketch. Uh, first of all, Wittgenstein would not have disagreed with this. Philosophy has always been about how everything all hangs together and so on. 
and he thought that insofar as it was, it had failed. So he argued that philosophy has to be restricted much more narrowly and should only concern what we can meaningfully say and what we can't. In other words, he wanted, he was interested in two of these sides to reality, the linguistic and the logical, and their relationship. And that's all philosophy was going to do, was analyze language in terms of modern logic. Um, he thought there was a lot of life more than that. And in fact, he was a Christian, and he held the belief in God with certainty. A lot of people don't know that about him. <laughs> they don't know that about him. And, uh, belief in God with certainty. And in fact, I have letters that he, uh, at home I have a book that has letters in it that he wrote to a friend of his and said, no, I don't think you should be ordained. He said, this friend wanted to become a clergyman. He said, you'd end up trying to prove the existence of God or something like that. It's not, and it's beyond proof. And I think that's right too. Um, so what, what he wanted to do was limit philosophy, but that's because he never saw what it is I'm going to present to you now. He never saw that there was a Christian approach to philosophy that before you actually started to make your own theories, you had to see that why the right way to set this up is not to ask, what's the string that strings all the beads together? Because that's the way it was always done. And he continued to do it that way. That's why he thought it had failed. He's right about that, does he? All right. How did the ancients who tried this theory start out? <coughs> Well, they were all pagan. And so what they wanted to do was find out what it is in the universe everything else depends on. That's the way you start. Now, if you remember, maybe you don't, I shouldn't put it that way, I, shouldn't have put, I apologize. When I was last here, I argued <laughs> that what's central to every religious belief every tradition of religious belief is identifying what it is that is divine. And that all religions agree on what it means to be divine. They do not agree on who or what is divine, but on what it means to be. Example, we have an election, and the election is so close that people don't agree on who was elected president. <laughs> This could never happen in this country, of course not. <laughs> Everybody still agrees on what it means to be the president. They just don't agree on who it is. <laughs> Clear? And that's what I'm saying is true about all the religions, whatever. They all agree on what it means to be divine. They just don't agree on who or what it is. And the, the agreement is that the divine is the self-existent reality which is the origin of everything not self-existent. Okay. I talked about this at length, but I will not assume that you were here <laughs> to hear that, or that you would remember it. A, a religious belief, I said, is a belief in something as divine, about how the non-divine depends on it, or about hu how humans come to stand in proper relation to it. The divine could be a realm of things, two beings, no being at all. It could, the, all kinds of conceptions can fit in that slot. But whatever you put into the slot of being the self-existent origin of everything else is your divinity belief. And to that extent, you've got a religion whether you call it that or not. Now, that, let me take that back to a question you asked, and I said, how you see the nature of reality and the nature of knowledge is chiefly going to be determined by what you think is divine, by what you think it is that's self-existent and the origin of everything else. And so what we get immediately in all the old, oldest theories of the, of the human race, the very first theories were theories of, of reality. They were ontologies. They weren't physics theories, math theories, biological theories, logic, and they were theories about the nature of reality as a whole. And they all tried to identify what it is in the universe that is self-existent and the origin of everything else. Everything else depends on it. And they had different candidates. But they were all features of the universe. <coughs> Do you remember this? The Greeks said, some said it was earth, air, fire, water. You remember that? 
And then Lucipetus Democritus said, no, no, it isn't earth, air, fire, or water. It's little tiny things called atoms. And how the atoms combine make earth or air or fire or water. You with me? <coughs> this is still 500 BC. <coughs> Plato, people like Plato and Aristotle said, it can't just be matter, though, no matter how you construe it. The atomic theory sounds right about how the different kinds of matter get here, but there has to be a rational side to the universe. So there have to be logical laws and mathematical laws. And so Plato, Pythagoras, Plato, and Aristotle argued that there wasn't one thing, there were two. There's the rational and the material, and they interact to make the cosmos that we experience but they're all picking some side of the cosmos. The physical, the logical, the mathematical, the spatial, to, to be what it is that is self-existent and everything else depends on it. Now, now we come to the tragic part of the story. The rise and spread of Christianity. What do Christian thinkers say when they confront this project? And I wish I could tell you that they said what they should have said, but they didn't. Well, before you go up there, everyone, I guess, has a view of the divine. No matter if you're atheist or everybody has some sort of box. They Whether they call it that or not, they do. So it's kind of human condition, then? I mean, that's just basic. There's no one that doesn't have that, right? They, they may have. The, I think that's true. I don't claim to be able to prove it. But nobody can propose a theory that doesn't assume a divinity which is pretty good evidence right there. I mean, if you can't make a theory about anything that doesn't presuppose a, some Something. divinity belief or other, then then anybody who believes any theory has got at least one divinity belief. Now, I, I defended that in my first book. The book is called The Myth of Religious Neutrality. And it argues that it's not possible to construct a theory about anything that doesn't either explicitly have or tacitly presuppose some divinity belief or other. And that the contents of the theory differ relative to whatever divinity belief is held. And it ends by asking, then what should a Christian philosophy look like that starts with God? What should its theory of reality look like? And the last three chapters explain Dewey's theory of reality, which is coming next week. Okay, that's what goes on in that book, but it, it takes ten chapters to lead up to that, only in the last three. So that, that gradually, this is for non-philosophers, it starts, I'm, I'm not saying it's speech reading, but it starts, you don't need philosophy to read it. You don't need to know philosophy to read it. But it starts with, what is a divinity belief, what's religion, what's a theory, what's the general relation between these two, and I argue that theories are all regulated, guided, by a divinity belief. Divinity belief sets a range within which theories look good, outside of which they don't. So it doesn't, it's not that if you have one divinity belief, you will have this theory. You will have some one of a range of theories. It underdetermines them in that sense, yeah. Yes, sir. So is this uh, deductive reasoning? You're starting from the general and going to the particulars? Um a equals no, B we're trying to get we're trying B to get a bead C. on the nature of the general. We're trying to get a bead on that. So as of yet, it's ne it's it's more inductive than deductive. We're looking at all the stuff that confronts us in the universe, all the different sides of the universe. That list that I had before, I said we could say each one is a different side of reality. A more precise way to put it is that the the things of reality that confront us in our everyday experience exhibit characteristics of every one of those kinds. Yeah? Try, try it. Here's an object. This object in our everyday experience seems to us to exhibit physical characteristics, solidity, spatial characteristics, size and location, mathematical characteristics, and there's a how much to it, quantity, and we can measure it in the number. It seems to us to exhibit logical characteristics. It's logically distinct from and distinguishable from everything else. It's not it. It has linguistic characteristics. It can be named. In English, it's a chair. In other languages, it's another word, but it's the same concept. Psychology. 
Yes, and it's, it's able to be perceived. We perceive colors, we feel smoothness and coldness, and uh, it makes noises when we bang it around. And, yeah, so it seems to have characteristics of all the kinds, and all the kinds of characteristics have laws among them. So, uh, psychological law. Being red excludes being blue. Nothing can be both red and blue all over at the same time. No, that's not. That's neither red nor blue. <laughs> okay, so uh, those different sides then hit people as less important, more important, more real, less real, and that's what's going on in this project. We're trying to get to what is it that's self-existent and therefore the origin of everything else. And we have all these candidates. All right, now you had a question too. Yeah, it, it sounded from what you were saying a little earlier that uh, divinity or belief in some kind of divinity is a product of the human mind. And where I, as I would think of it as divinity exists and uh, the human mind tries to discover it. Uh, Okay. Rather than inventing yeah. it. Right? Yeah. No, I didn't suggest that we invent it. Oh, uh, but I, well, I thought you. Well, I, 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 no, I, I thought to find you said it was a product of human. They thinking. try to find the divine. The the central issue in every religion is to identify what it is that is divine, and then specify how humans should stand in proper relation to it. And people have a huge variety of things that they put into that slot. Uh, of what it is, what the divine is, on which everything else depends. Now, this, this, if one is a pagan, that's an, uh, an old-timey term. A, a better term would be the more the, the modern term, naturalist, with a capital N. That's someone who says all there is is the universe. The universe is self-existent. <coughs> okay, the cosmos, whatever term you want to use, the pluriverse, universe. Cosmos, I don't care. It's the world open to our experience, able to be studied by all these different sciences. That's all there is. Or if there is anything else, we don't know and it doesn't matter because this is self existent. Now, obviously, not everything in the natural world is self existent. Things come into being and pass away all the time. Whatever does, that's not self existent. So the question is to find what it is in the natural world, which is. Because it's not the stuff we observe, is it? It's not trees and mountains and clouds. It's not even continents. It's certainly not people and animals. They all die, they all move, they all change, they all come into being and pass away. So what is it? Well, in the ancient world, they thought that if some things just never changed, that was the best evidence that they were self-existent. And so they picked the stars, because the stars never move. Now, actually, we know that they do. We can measure it, but they couldn't, so they looked fixed. So Aristotle called the stars visible gods. Mm. And that's why, because they were changeless. And therefore, that was the best hint that they were also self-existent. Okay. These are examples. Now, clearly, a Christian coming on all of this should have said, should have said, <laughs> But we already know the only being that is self-existent is God. And everything other than God depends on God. So it is not the case, this is what they should have said, it's not the case that there's anything in the universe everything else in the universe depends on. The whole thing depends on some on God who is not in the universe, except when he visits. <laughs> but he's a distinct being from the universe. And he has brought into existence everything other than himself and sustains it all. And they didn't say that. They didn't do it. What they did was retain this. Retain it. And say, oh, but this is cool if we just then say and that, in turn, depends on God. This is 99.99% of all the Christian thinkers who ever wrote and thought. In the West, 
in the Latin-speaking Western part of the church. In the East, they didn't do, do this. They said, oh, but nothing can be that because only Christ is that. In him, all, by him were all things created and in him all things hang together. What is it that hangs them all together? God in Christ and not anything in the universe at all and they rejected that. So it wasn't that every Christian missed it, but in our tradition, in the Western Church, in the Latin-speaking Western Church, this is what happened 99% of the time. I'm not quite clear the difference between saying God is, is the center of the universe and God is the creator of the universe and sustainer. I, I, well, they're making a difference. They're saying, let's keep doing ontology the way it has been doing. We'll locate what it is in the universe everything else depends on. And that's not pagan if we then say, and that in turn depends on God. So this becomes the mediator between God and everything else. This is how God sustains everything else, by having this create all the rest, and he creates that. Right. Can you give examples? of? Sure. Uh, yeah. Christian thinkers have held a following Plato and Aristotle that there is a combination of matter and what they call rational form and that, that the rational forms are logic and mathematics and then matter is maybe atoms and that the two together form what they call substances. Now, that's easy to explain. Stands under. This is what is in in each and everything and stands under all its other characteristics and generates them all. So there's a substance of what it is to be a chair and a human being and a horse and a cloud and a mountain. And that's what makes it what it is. And its rational plus physical characteristics interact in order to generate all its other characteristics. Biological, social, economic, they're all created by the by these two interacting. Or it might just be that you're a materialist. There's nothing here but matter. There are Christians right now, Christians, who hold who are just fine thinkers, hold distinguished positions in universities, who say maybe materialism's right. It's matter alone that generates everything else about the cosmos. As long as we say, and God created matter, we're okay. We're not pagans. But you understand. What this does is regard <coughs> philosophy like the birthday party donkey. You know the kids put the donkey <coughs> up on the wall and then blindfolded they try to pin the tail of the donkey? So this says philosophy is the donkey. And then we either pin God on like the tail or we don't. And if we don't, we're pagans or naturalists. And if we do, we're Christians. But pinning the tail on the donkey doesn't change the donkey at all. It's the same flaming theory. It differs in not a whit whether you tin the tail on or you don't. And whatever made them think that that was the way to do philosophy was to take philosophy for what it had always been and pin God on when they should have said, now since we know God, how should philosophy go? Now I'm saying all of this because this is exactly what Dewey Weird did. No, we're not going to do this because Colossians says that only God and Christ hangs everything together. There's nothing in the universe that does that. I, I quote one of the Eastern uh, Orthodox <coughs> thinkers, St. Gregory Palamas said about this, the Christian can tolerate no mediating substance between God and creatures because it's only Christ that hangs it all together. Remember Sellers? Philosophy is about how all things in the widest sense of things hang together in the widest sense of hang together. And here in Colossians 1, Paul says, it's Christ who makes all things hang together. Not matter, not form and matter, not sensation and logic, not mathematics and physics. All of the candidates of Western philosophy, the long parade of mix and match, picking which sides are the real, are the ones that generate all the rest, are all wrong and should all be rejected. That's the approach 
that Dewey Root's going to take. Belief in God should control our approach by making us start with the confession that we already know the only self-existent creator of all things, and that's no part of the cosmos at all. And now how do we view the rest of the cosmos? That we have a number of questions, so I'll take them in the order I saw. <coughs> I guess I'm confused when I'm thinking about individual beads. And so one of those beads might be um, biological science. That's a bead, it's not the philosophy, but within that, there, you know, those scientists are saying evolutionary theory seems to be the way the cosmos, or at least the Earth, is created or something. Well, like And so, so then are we talking about an overarching philosophy or are we talking about a bead that Christians can say, oh, I can see how God maybe works in that or you know I'm a I'm I'm a counselor right so we got these various theories of counseling right yes. it's not an overarching string it's right. a beat and so you can see well the, we got the psychoanalytic you got the cognitive you got the gestalt and how right. do we as Christians that's right. Are we pinning the tail on, or you know, because this is just. I think if, if it's we a start, bead, it's not the whole. That's right. Whole but life. if we start the, the way <laughs> Dewey Root's recommending, yeah. and we get a theory of reality yeah. that allows for all of these and traces out their interactions mm -hmm. without claiming that any one is supreme and all the rest depend right. on it, then we're going to get a better view of it than if we start with that bias. It's some one mm -hmm. or two mm -hmm. that make all the others, and therefore <coughs> they're the most important. Therefore, we tend to reduce the others to these. Now, that we can term, bring our faith to our particular field, right? Right. Let's see how our faith can this is, is that a pinning the tail? No. Okay. By starting with God, <laughs> right. and, and then refusing to collapse all the others to any one or two of these, then we get a proper view of them without overestimating any one and therefore correspondingly underestimating the others. Right. We'll get a better view of how right. they hang together. Right. That's, that's that's where okay. he's going. Right. So he, to anticipate, would say that all these different theories uh, depend upon regarding some one of these aspects of reality as more important than any of the others, right. as determinative. Right. So it's it's the psychological aspect if you have psychoanalytic theory, and it's it's the biological if you have evolutionary something mm -hmm. theory. Now, at the same time. It's allowing, though, that any of these theories may have a Christian interpretation. Right. So by saying this, we don't mean that we have to throw out atomic theory and get another theory of physics. What we have is a Christian interpretation of atomic theory that doesn't say, but an atom is purely physical or an atom is purely logical or mathematical or only mathematical physical. Atoms, too, function in all those ways alike. Atoms have every one of those sides to them. They're not purely physical. Because physicists study the physical characteristics of atoms, it doesn't follow that's all they have. Reduction. Physicists can study the physical, <laughs> the physical properties right. of the chair, right. but there's more, more pro kinds of properties of the chair than just the physical. You see, it's always that, that deifying one that tends to blind you to the rest. Now, I, I just a moment ago used the term reduce the others to this, and it sounds like a Jenny Craig terminology. But in <laughs> fact, that's the term that philosophers use. When they claim that Nothing this possible. generates the rest, that's weak reduction. The others are there, they're real, but they depend on this. Strong reduction says, oh, but there's only this. The others are all mistakes. Mm -hmm. So you can get strong, eliminative reduction, or weak causal reduction, but either way, if you've picked any part of the universe to be the origin of all the rest, you're, you have a reduction theory. Now, what Dewey is going to say then, preliminary step to next week, a Christian view is going to be a completely non-reductionist view of reality. Down, right? Completely non-reductionist. Mm -hmm. None of the aspects of creation generate all the other aspects of creation. They exhibit many kinds of interrelations, but none is the cause of all the rest. Only God is the cause of all, he sustains all, and God's laws account for the relationships that hang them together. And no, no one of them accounts for that. The villain of this piece, as I see it, is Aristotle. Or rather, the falling in love with Aristotle that overtakes first the East, then in the West, between the 8th and the 12th centuries. That you, you say he was the philosopher 
The Aristotle believed in etern eternality of matter. Yes, it always was here. And this form. stuff seeps in. And form. For, he's a dualist. Form and matter. Right. So matter never was created, neither were the forms. The combination makes substances, and substances are the underlying reality, each and every individual thing. He was studying the Celtic Church, say, until the Synod of Whitby, which I think is 687. The, the, the fringe church, the Celtic French, was very evangelical and very biblically faithful in all of their doctrine. It's the fact that Aristotle comes in, first infects the Arabs. The Arabs, after two centuries of dealing yes, with and him, then tire of him. Then, at that point, he's picked up by the scholastics of Paris. Well, particularly Thomas Aquinas. Of course. But Thomas Aquinas' uh, program for philosophy was that Aristotle had given us an account of the world. It's full, everything's reducible to form and matter. And that, that gives us, a, and the Bible gives us a view of God. You put the two together and you have the whole, the whole thing. Well, I, I beg to differ a bit on that. There were many philosophers before Aristotle that had this same attitude. Phys physics uh, based oh, sure. reductionism. Start with Thales, 1000 BC. Sure. Everything is made of water. That's where natural science began. Natural philosophy began, yes. right? Yeah, and so I mean, this uh, this is way before Aristotle. Yeah, but no, we're talking about it coming into Christian theology mm -hmm. and how Aristotle came into Christian theology. Well, gr the Greek philosophers came into, but Christian, including well, Plato. Plato was in before Aristotle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So there were plenty of people that combined Plato with Christianity right. before they did Aristotle, uh -huh. because Aristotle was lost for a long right. time. Right. Right. Then when Aristotle was rediscovered, that's what how he was talking about. Yeah. Um, well, Aristotle was translated um, by the Muslims from Greek into, right. into Arabic, the, the and then certain century. scholars in Europe translated the Arabic into right. Latin, and then it made a big impact, and Thomas Aquinas championed this, uh, Aquinas died in 1278, I think. Mm -hmm. So th that was his life's work, was to say, take this view, this Aristotelian view of, the, of, the, of creation, the biblical view of God, and you've got the whole picture, there's reality. Don't but it didn't revise this on the uh -huh. basis of the knowledge right. of God. Okay. Knowledge of God is added on to this. It's still the pin the tail on the donkey. So the first thing you have to understand about next week is that what you're going to be presented with is one way a Christian philosophy could go based on the principle that only God is self-existent. There's nothing in the world the rest of the world depends on. It all depends on God. Then you, what would a non-reductionist view of reality look like? I mean, look, it's been 2,600 years of theories of reality, and they've all been reductionist. They all claim the way to explain the world is find what it depends on and relate to all, everything to that. And if there's nothing in the universe like that, then how do you construct the theory? I had a colleague in the department say, I said, this is a non-reductionist theory of reality. He says, if it doesn't reduce, how can it explain? <laughs> and I said, well, read it and find out. <laughs> Now, the, the fact is, in case you're curious, the people that have read this, even my little three-chapter account of how Dewey Reed's philosophy goes, are mightily blown away. <laughs> Whoa, that's really amazing. Yeah, that's the kind of reaction you get. I mean from non-Christians. They don't even share it, but they see, well, you know what? All those reductions weren't the only way. Here's another way it could go. But, but mark how I've put this. Here's a way it could go. Keep in mind that theories are our best guesses. Calling this a Christian theory doesn't mean that we got the theories out of the Bible. It doesn't mean that they're revealed by God. There's nothing certain about them. It means making those guesses in a Christian way that's guided by the principle that nothing in the universe is divine, nothing in the universe is what everything else depends on, that whatever account we give, it's got to be non-reductionist, and if we find our theories leading us into reduction, then we know there's something wrong with it. It's that kind, of, that's why I'm saying it's a, it's a Christian approach to doing this. It does not hand you the contents on the silver platter. And it doesn't make them infallible. And it doesn't identify them with the Christian faith. Hmm. So there's plenty of... That's why I was very careful to put, here's one way a non-reductionist philosophy could go. Hmm. It happens to be exceedingly brilliant. But it doesn't make it right. And Dewey Ridge said to me, all my theories may need to be changed or abandoned. See? So 
under no illusion about that. Okay. So it's not theology. <laughs> all right. We're, all we're doing is clearing the brush for the foundation. Here. Yes, question. Well, I'm still struggling with... Uh, you use the terms self-existent yes. and dependent. Yes. Dependent meaning uh, that what it depends upon creates the rest. Um, we are, I don't see that we, we need to, we are not abandoning theories of how the world evolved. That in terms of in time sequence, in terms of structure, uh, all here no, I hear all, all I hear you're saying is that whatever exists in the cosmos has to start as a we believe in God and uh, with God, yes. and everything else follows from it. But everything follows from it in various sequences yes. and forms and everything yeah. else. Joyrule go to great pains to account for these, uh, these, so these sequences. These so wor the words self-existent. Uh, I'm not sure. Yes, you're obviously... Self-existent here um, means, uh, and the term that I prefer is, unconditionally non-dependent. Mm -hmm. I think that's logically the cleanest term, but uh, what we're talking about has been used, many, many different terms have been used for it. The simple word, created and not created. Could be. That works. As long so as here, are other, here are a whole set of other terms that people use for the same thing. Absolute. Ase. The medievals talked about God being ase in himself, what exists in itself. And so they talked about God's aseity, his in, in himselfness. Um, ultimate reality. One philosopher used uncaused and unpreventable. In, in, in the I Ching, not to talks about the unproduced producer of all else. Uh, there are all kinds of terms. They're all getting at the same thing. I thought self-existent might be the easiest, um, but uh, it doesn't much matter which, which term. You, they, they all say the same thing. This is what just is. Now, uh, and, and everything else that's not what just is depends on what just is. This is the, the, you know, you realize that, that um, Mr. Dawkins has even said to Christians as a rebuttal, well, if God produced the world, then what produced God? No, that, that is either uh, inexcusably ignorant or just plain stupid. <laughs> because Christians have always said that God is eternal, self-existent, and, and the creator of everything else. So why would you ask somebody... Uh, well, well, what produced what you believe to be self-existent? Um, there's, n there's no excuse for that. And Christians have only said this for 2,000 years unanimously, so, you know, I guess it's too much to expect them to know it. I, I just lost Paul, well, and then how are you? Then yeah, uh, I, think, uh, there's, I think there's a distinction to be made between a historical origin and a ontological origin, right? And I think that's often we get those mixed up. Uh, so that when you're talking about creator, you're not talking creation. You're not talking about some kind of historical account of uh, what happened when. Right. You're talking about the idea of the, the ground of being or the existence of something. Yes, uh, that follows because. Uh, because historical most Christians is one, have one have of those reductionists. Uh, almost all Christians have held that God created time. So it couldn't yeah, be right. that, that uh, we're just talking about uh, something like what happens when God acts himself in time and produces something. Uh, but this is the sustaining of everything, including time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I guess there's still the nagging, you know, so what? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, let's say, you know, we have a biblical, you know, a, a sense of God creating, but that doesn't mean that pe that scientists and others won't continue to find that general theory of everything, you know, that how, how is this world created? What, what are the found, what are those reductionistic, sure part, you know, particles that create, how does that change anything in terms of the way science or philosophy is, is conducted? Even if you have that worldview, 
there's still yeah, that you tendency have, you have to... You have a Christian view of, of that same science. Yeah, right. But, rather but, than but nothing really changes, though. Right? I mean, there can still, you can still be looking for how, how does God work in the universe? How does he create? What, what are those fundamental... Whether they're mathematical or particles, you know, um, what, okay. what, how, what did God do? <laughs> okay. Uh, here we have to make a careful distinction, mm -hmm. which theologians have almost all been careful to make, uh, between God's sustaining everything, uh, including the laws by which the universe yeah, the operates, the universe. Yeah. and God doing something in the universe, which is very different. Yeah. So God does act within his creation. He acts to make himself known. He comes incarnate in Christ. He, he does things which have causal sequences that follow from them because he really performs actions. We, the only knowledge we can have of those is when that's recorded in Scripture, or if we were, I guess, if we were to witness a miracle for ourselves, we believe that we just saw it happen. But, um, but that's different from how he sustains. That we cannot know. Yeah, the physical laws of the universe. Yeah, but we can't know how God, how God brings it about that there's a creation rather than no creation. How does God sustain the world? How does God sustain space and time and all the laws? We, we can, there's no account of that. That's why the Bible it begins with anthropomorphism, doesn't it? It begins with, and God said. But right away you know God doesn't have a body and he doesn't have lips and a tongue and he doesn't breathe air and talk. He's bringing into existence everything else. There is no way to describe that. It has to be anthropomorphic. So it has to talk about God as though we were a human and humans were doing something in a work week. But it starts with anthropomorphism, which tells you that what follows is largely going to be couched that way and not, not to be taken literally. And the guy that wrote that knew that. The guy that wrote that didn't believe that God already had a body and there was already an atmosphere so that God could talk. Okay. So we have to distinguish those two things. So if you're saying, oh, well, then what's different? Well, one of those you can't get an account of at all. The other is an account of God's specific acts in history, his saving acts. That's what scripture gives us a record of. And as to how all the rest of this works, that's our project. Right. We want, we're curious about our world. We want to find out how it works. But are we going to find out how it works by assuming some one part of it creates all the rest? If so, that's the most important part always. That's the dominant one. We underestimate the others, and we get a, a, an askewed, a skewed theory that can't be right. Or are we going to see them all as equally real sides to reality and trace out the relationships between them without trying to collapse any one to any other? And then you get a, an even-handed picture of the whole. That's the, that's the difference. So... Um, uh, so I wasn't quite sure with the, about the so what. So what is, now Christians can have their own view. They're not stuck with being told, well, physics says this by a guy that absolutizes physics. Right. Or physics says this by a guy who deifies mathematics. Right. See, you're not bound to that interpretation. You have to recognize the difference side. between, yeah. here's what we find, when, when we shoot these particles through a Wilson cloud chamber, we get the following streaks. Okay, fine. But now how do we understand them? Well, maybe it's just sense perceptions, it's purely physical, it's mathematically caused. No, it's mathematically measured, but not caused. So, yeah. Jesus prays, before the world was, I was with you. Yeah. That means that God the Father and God the Son are out and before Yes. And after and through yes. what we know is the space time corridor. So you've yes. got to relativize the space time corridor to understand any sense of the eternality of God. No. May I? I'm going to append something. I'm going to hang something on that. Like, like the tail of the donkey. But it's Some more important. Uh, I did give a talk here about two ideas of the nature of God. I don't know how, if anybody here remembers that or even was here. Uh, in one view, of the nature of God, the view that came to prevail in the West by combining scripture with Plato and Aristotle. The view was that the characteristics of God are all uncreated because God is. And if they're uncreated in God, they're uncreated in the world. The same characteristic can't be both created and uncreated. That's self-contradictory. So if God is one, 
then God didn't create mathematics because he didn't create numbers. Because it's what he is. If God thinks, then God didn't create the laws of logic because that's how, what you need to think. So the laws of logic are uncreated. If God is good, then goodness in the world is uncreated. God has it perfectly, we have it imperfectly, but it's the same uncreated property. And that's another reason why the Western, because of that Western theology, they didn't mind saying there were parts of the universe that were uncreated. See, there are parts that everything else depends on. They're just the properties God has. And I showed you why in the Eastern Church and in Luther and in Calvin, they denied that and said that all the characteristics revealed to us by God are ones he has created and taken on. I'll quote Calvin to you. Since he's, if this was the Lutheran church, I'd quote Luther. <laughs> Calvin says, every characteristic, every perfection ascribed to God in scripture is found in creation and hence is not God per se, but how God relates to us. That's word for word, despite Al planning it. <laughs> I quoted that to Alan. He says, oh, but Calvin doesn't mean that. Why do you write that? <laughs> okay. So you understand there's more going on here to motivate these early Christians to keep the pagan scheme and just tag God on. And, and Doibert, following Calvin, is going to reject that. <coughs> and say, no, 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 you start with God, you already know what self the self-existent origin of everything else, and therefore it's nothing in the universe. It's not just that this isn't divine, it also isn't what everything else depends on, because Colossians 1 combines the divine with what, it, what, hangs, what makes everything hang together, right? God's the creator of, we just read it, everything visible or invisible. Did you notice that that covers everything? <laughs> Everything's either visible or it's not, including goodness, mathematics, logic, all the things they said were the, the West said had to be uncreated because they were true of God. This says God created. F follow. So, so what the Western thinkers tried to do was separate <laughs> divinity from what everything else in the universe depends on. Right? They wanted to keep a something within the universe everything else depends on, but make God the divinity by making this depend on, in turn on God. What the reformers and the orthodox theologians said was, there is no such thing here. There is only God, and God is both. That the origin of everything else and what continues to sustain it and hang it all together. So we're not going to look within the universe for that. And as a consequence, uh, I'll add, Eastern thought kissed off philosophy just about altogether. So in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, there's almost no messing with philosophy because philosophy says that corrupt stuff where they try to keep all the pagan thought. And they view theology very warily also. Theology is just to help you in your Christian life. It's not big theory. Sets of books of, of theories like a science, like Thomas Aquinas calling the Summa Theologic uh, uh, is theology, which is the science of God. They think that's nuts. There's no science of God. You don't st study God like you're putting them under, under a microscope. You, you uh, try to explain his word and apply it to people's lives, and that's what theology is for, encouraging the life, the faith life of, of the believer, period. So uh, they abandoned it all together. I, I want to. Uh, it seems to me what you're, or what's, what's implied here is that God is, is in some sense unknowable. Yes. That all we can study is what he reveals. Right. Right on both counts. You're quoting Calvin. Okay. And Luther, and all the Orthodox theologians. <laughs> and where, where I think a lot of us are, are all of uh, at least everything of science that I have read, one of the things that is assumed is that if you name it, you understand it. Mm. Well, that if, it's, it's know, assumed by a lot of people. And lot of, you know, you know, to, to a great extent. Yeah. But it's false. It's yeah. Certain, yeah. But, but that's, that's the way we hang things together. But look, here's a real easy 
this may seem a far out illustration, but it's an easy illustration of why that's false. I can have the idea of all the numbers nobody will ever think of. <laughs> I have that idea, and I can name it. That doesn't let me know any of those numbers. Because as soon as I know one, it's not a member of that class anymore. Right. Like so. that, that, that you have uh, more than one uh, more than one set of, of uh, infinite series. Okay. So it's not true. The the both the Calvin says about God that what we need to do is attend to His Word and never think about God except as we have Scripture for our guide. Now how can man? who cannot know his own essence, know the essence of God. <laughs> In his commentary on Genesis, he puts it this way. As for those who proudly soar above the world to view God in his unveiled essence, it's inevitable that they entangle themselves in figments of their own imagination. There is the God, God at core is unknowable to us. God has, and this is, uh, this again is one of the orthodox uh, saints, theologians, but God has imposed upon himself a really diverse mode of existence which we can understand out of his love for us. And of course the chief example of that is the incarnation coming, embodying himself in Jesus Christ and that's how, that's what we, that's how we know God. There is the, the picture of God. The visible image of the invisible God. Again, from our scripture this morning. 